Hi, everybody. I would like to welcome you to the third GLP webinar on co-production in the field of land system science. My name is Isabel Provitoli. I work at the International Program Office of the Global Land Program, which is hosted at the Center for Development and the Environment at the University of Bern. This webinar is hosted by GLP and supported by the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation. I will be moderating this webinar jointly with my colleague Albrecht Ehrensberger from CDE. But before we start, I would like uh, to provide an overview of the webinar series. Let's just see. I'm trying to change to my next slide. Yeah, here we go. So we had the first webinar in June. It was an introductory webinar setting the stage about co-production in the field of land system science. Then we had a second webinar which was illustrating a practical example about the use of different methods for co-production. So this webinar was about adaptive landscape approaches using role-playing games. And today we will hear another practical example about modeling, scenario building and forecasting. This webinar of today will then be followed by a fourth webinar about the use of spatial tools, remote sensing, GIS and so on. So all um, the three webinars um, showing practical examples will then followed by a fifth webinar which provides a synthesis and the, in that webinar we will jointly elaborate a change theory for co-production of sustainable land systems and the results of this webinar series will then be presented in a breakout session at the GLP open science meeting next year. So before we start today's webinar, I would like to give the floor to Lauren Hertel. She will share with us some housekeeping rules. So please, Lauren. Yes, thank you, Isabel. Welcome, everyone. My name is Lauren Hertel. I'm the communications manager for the GLP, which is the Global Land Program. As you each came into the room today, your microphones were automatically muted. We do that because we expect up, upwards of uh, 100 attendees on today's call, so it would be quite distracting to have everyone's mics open. But we do want to make sure that you have lots of opportunity to ask questions. So you can use the chat window or the questions box during the presentations and then also during the Q&A sessions to ask questions as, as you need to or as you'd like to. And we will be taking those um, at different points during the webinar today. If you have any technical troubles during the webinar or you just need uh, assistance, maybe you can't hear someone correctly, you've got audio issues, the feed drops out for any reason, please feel free to use the chat box to message me directly. You can uh, open the chat window and use the chat window to send a message to the organizers, uh, organizers only, and that will reach me and I can help you then on, in the back end of the webinar to solve any problems you might have. So again, please keep your mics muted and uh, enjoy the webinar. And from there, I'm handing off to, who am I handing off to, Isabel? Next is Albi. Ah, okay, Albi. great. Okay, thank you very much, Isabel and Lauren. I don't know if you can see my title slide now on the screen. We're about to switch to you. Here we go. Okay. Thank you very much. I have to accept that, I think. Yes. I'm very excited about the positive response that we have had so far in this webinar series, and I'm happy to announce that we have by now 58 attendees, and I'm sure that more will trickle in as we move on. A very warm welcome from my side as well to all participants and to our three speakers, whom I will briefly introduce in a few minutes. Today's topic, as captured in the session's title, is about looking into possible futures together with various stakeholders 
and broadly speaking on issues that concern uh, and concerns that are related to sustainable land use and management. Looking into the future, making forecasts or imagining various scenarios about the future usually raises various reactions ranging from fascination to boredom and from skepticism to blind trust, such as, for example, the colleague of Dilbert in this cartoon. But why do we need to make scenarios when it comes to finding solutions for sustainable land systems? Would it not be sufficient to understand the system, to know what the issues are now, to agree on how to prioritize them and to develop solutions to address them? The thing is that when departing from an unsustainable situation that one has described and understood, one needs to identify sustainability targets in order to know in what direction to go. For example, the Agenda 2030 is doing this. If the loss of natural habitats was identified as a sustainability priority, target knowledge will involve answering questions such as, do we want to protect all types of habitats because they are all important? Or do we think that some are more important than others? And more generally, how much space do we want to set aside for nature? Such questions are highly normative as different groups of stakeholders might have antagonistic views on them. And once agreement was reached about the desirable future, agreement also needs to be reached on the way to get there. On the same example of natural habitats, the questions to be addressed will include what habitats do we protect first and where? Who has what responsibility in it and who pays, etc. In short, target and transformation knowledge are very much about how to shape the future and scenarios can inform these processes by visualizing the outcomes of various claims and visions about the future. But why do we need co-design and co-production in such processes? After all, scenario modeling seems to be quite a technical thing. Let us take a local context somewhere where land provides various benefits and services, such as food, fuel, and places for recreation and worship to local communities, as well as places for wildlife. Achieving sustainable land systems in such a context means that involved stakeholders are in a position to reach goal-oriented and equitable solutions and decisions, sorry. This in turn means that they have found ways and guidance on how to navigate trade-offs between antagonistic targets. And this means that they need knowledge on how to do this and on what the likely outcome of specific actions will be. And that is where the potential of participatory scenarios comes in. Our speakers will guide us through what this really means in concrete project contexts, such that by the end of the webinar, you'll be all be convinced about the usefulness of such approaches. Jörg Pries from UFZ in Leipzig will talk to us about participatory scenarios at various scales with a focus on Northern Mongolia, Central Germany and Europe. Enrico Celio of the ETH in Zurich will tell us about participatory modeling using Bayesian networks. I firmly count on him to make even me understand what is hidden behind this mysterious concept. Finally, Jürgen Reinhardt of Quantis in Zurich will shed light on the potential of formative scenarios, scenario methods for the assessment of biomass energy potential in East Africa. With that, I would like to ask Jörg to get ready to introduce himself and his work and to give his presentation. Thank you all for your attention. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. So I would take over the first part of the participatory modeling, scenario building and forecasting techniques in land system science, which is about participatory scenario development at different scales. 
And as you can see from my long list of authors, I'm not the only one who contributed to that, but uh, many people have contributed to the different studies I would like to use as examples today. Um, let me introduce myself very briefly. <clears throat> I have a background in ecology and forestry. And since 10 years now, I'm working at the Center for Environmental Research, UFZ in Leipzig. And I'm leading a small team <clears throat> which is focusing on um, climate change related impacts on environment, environmental services, ecosystem services, scenario development and analysis. We're also involved in simulation of land use dynamics and more recently we started a branch with uh, participatory mapping and evaluation mainly of cultural ecosystem services. Okay, so that, that much to the background and I saved the time and uh, which I have then hopefully to present a more, few more slides. So, participatory scenario development. What is this about? Why do we need scenarios and why should they be participatory? Before we start with this business, <clears throat> I would like to provide a short definition of what a scenario is. So that's a plausible description of how the future may unfold. So that's a very broad definition. But scenarios have typically uh, some components like storylines, sets of drivers of change. They say something about their spatial temporal coverage, a starting year, they may use visualizations and so on. Okay, why scenarios? And why not visions, forecasts, or just technical solutions? Well, scenarios are approaches which are particularly useful when we have situations in which we have a high complexity and a relatively high level of uncertainty. Now, if you consider that we are talking about land systems and land systems usually are complex social environmental systems mostly driven in their changes by multiple often interacting factors then we would have exactly um, the optimum high complexity high uncertainty so that would be really suitable to be assessed by scenarios And what do we expect to gain when we use participatory or co-design approaches? Well, like uh, other co-development approaches, um, a number of um, benefits or increases are expected when involving stakeholders. And these are especially related to increasing the credibility of the approach, for example, in terms of consistency and coherence, the legitimacy, the relevance for the groups, the scenarios are developed for, and also to increase impact, um, for example, in terms of learning, communication, but also in terms of supporting governance and policy. Now, over the last couple of years, um, I have been involved in, but also leading a couple of studies. And in the third column, you will see that not all of them have a high level of co-design. So what I do today is that I use example of the studies with the highest level of co-design to exemplify um, the advantages of participatory scenario development, but also some of the limitations. Now, when you start putting scenario co-design into practice, <clears throat> one of the first things you probably think about is how can I select my stakeholders? And as we are working in a land-related context, what we usually do is we think about um, 
land users which are organized in unions, associations and so forth, but also including authorities at different levels, depends on the level of the study. And ask the question, are they engaged in sustainable land use? Do they influence land use decision? Do they depend on the resource land or are they affected by land use or land use change? And these stakeholders we try um, to include in a very balanced fashion, for example, across economic sectors, societal groups, but also um, covering different subregions or countries if relevant. The next question um, uh, up here in the upper right, I have a, a very nice example where we have been successful to invite uh, the stakeholders uh, in a really well distributed fashion but it not always works as perfect as this. Now the next step is the question um, which scenario components could be co-designed. There are various options and today I would like to address two of them. That's first um, the assessment of drivers of change in terms of their identification and hopefully also the quantification of them. And second, um, to develop storylines with the stakeholders, which are the narratives describing these plausible pathways into the future. I will not talk about scenario analysis because that's mostly covered by my two colleagues who will report about scenario analysis using simulation models. So I have here in the lower part a very short summary about participatory methods which are often applied in such an approach. First, the development process in which we use, for example, uh, ex-ante surveys. I will show you one example in a minute. Um, workshops or Delphi's, so different um, methods to design the co-development process. Then we need elements of quality insurance. So we can ask the, the question, do we achieve our objectives? with the methods that we are applying. Um, are we using iterative procedures so we get feedback from scientists and stakeholders, um, but also we could involve additional experts if the expertise is insufficient and so forth and so forth. And in the end, of course, we would like to evaluate the process. How successful has it been? for stakeholders, did we achieve our objectives? So this can be done, for example, via ex post surveys, but also when we start to publish via peer review. Okay, so the next step, I would like to show you one example in a large European project where we had the chance to do an ex ante survey of uh, 24 regional case study groups. So in the beginning of the scenario process we were asking them what do you think are the most important factors influencing land use and land use change and the provision of ecosystem services. So ecosystem services played a dominant role in that project so this is why they are prominent here in the driver list. Okay, now as you can see, <coughs> stakeholders had a very broad um, set of assumptions, both positive and very negative, about how um, the supply of particular ecosystem services in the future would look like. Now, this can worry you, but We've seen that very positively because these strongly contrasting assumptions help you define upper and lower bounds of different scenarios. So you have an idea what you won't be achieving or what you may be urgently wanting to avoid. 
as outcome of a scenario based on these assumptions that have been made by stakeholders ex ante. Participatory scenarios also enable us to integrate across various topics, knowledge domains of different stakeholders, and also across scales. I use two examples here. The first example is from Mongolia, a regional study in northern Mongolia, where we interviewed, as you can see here, a lot of farmers and herders, also mining company, which are very important in the region. And we had several um, workshops with um, representatives of different ministries, agriculture, environment, and industry. Now, the challenge that we observed in this stakeholder process was that uh, we <coughs> collect, collected a lot of relevant information from local practitioners, but when we used that in the workshops with high-level representations of ministries, much of this information um, was not accepted, it was rather rejected, and it turned out that um, these representatives had partly very strong opinions and uh, very strong, say, also resentments against opinions of other representatives. So the challenge here was not only to integrate different forms of knowledge, but also to handle very strong personalities. Um, in the second case, <clears throat> a study in central Germany, uh, three federal states in the eastern part of Germany, we, had, we made the observation that during the ex ante survey, which we did uh, separately for scientists of different institutions who were involved and local practitioners, it turned out that the perceptions of the local practitioners were more focused on drivers of regional scale, whereas the scientists tended to think about more about larger scale, national scale, global scale drivers like climate change or the changing economy. So <clears throat> We tried to um, link these different perspectives and views and try to find ways to prioritize um, drivers that were found uh, important by stakeholders. We used a methodology to identify critical uncertainties that would be uncertainties considered both um, of high importance and of high uncertainty. And what you see here on the right hand side is just the prioritization, uh, prioritization <coughs> a process by stakeholders. Now participatory scenarios also enable us to assess potentially conflicting perspectives trade-offs in objectives and again I use the um, Mongolian examples. Challenges that we identified here were related to the fact that we had limited land and especially limited water resources, but all sectors who were involved um, had the intention to expand their activities. So there was a clear political um, objective uh, both of the mining industry and of the agricultural industry. Um, that was kind of um, causing problems because it was obvious that you could not have everything at the same time. So there would be trade-offs, especially uh, in terms of uh, climate change. So 
<clears throat> both industries, the mining industry and also the farming industry use huge amounts of water. And on top of that, it was foreseen that um, the population increase, especially the urban population, would also increase considerably, adding to the already high water demands of the other sectors. The second point was that um, the experts and the representatives of the ministries had partly very contrasting ideas about the water use for different purposes, which varied partly up to tenfold. So, which is again good for upper and lower bounds of scenarios, but it, which is not so good in the discussion process if people tend not to accept uh, the perspectives of other participants. Okay, so <clears throat> what we did here is that we also tried again to include um, knowledge domains from the surveys we conducted in the fields. Those, as I said earlier, were difficult to integrate um, in these more high-level workshops with the authorities and representatives of ministries. Um, and another problem occurred, which uh, was very relevant, but for which we didn't find a good solution. Um, we couldn't report illegal activities that have been reported to us by farmers. For example, um, illegal extraction of large amounts of water for agriculture and herding from ground filter and surface water. Usually they need permits and usually they have to pay for that. Um, almost nobody's doing that. So it's a relevant problem, but this information could not be handed over to uh, the representatives of the ministries and other authorities. That would have caused considerable problems. So we didn't find a good solution here. In the end, we included it in the scenarios, but not in the discussion process with the authorities. Now, another aspect is that participatory um, scenarios enable us to bridge scales and develop scenarios for different purposes. In the last example from um, the openness study with the 27 case study, we had three uh, target audiences. First, um, we wanted to develop the scenarios as a scientific tool as at EU scale and do comparative simulation studies. Here you see the discussion of the first results during a workshop in, uh, I think it was in Spain. Um, so that refers to modeling, so I will not ever elaborate on that. But so we Eric, also use. Yes. Sorry, can you slowly come to an end, please. Yep. Your time is running out. Yep. Thanks. And we also use the scenarios um, to provide information for downscaling from European level um, to the case study level, involving from the beginning onwards the original case studies, but at one occasion also um, EU level stakeholders. So we had to be very pragmatic and involve them at a later time when drafts of scenarios had already been developed. So we ensured feedback loops to make sure that uh, uh, the drafts could be improved. And that was it. Um, just a short comment on how we structured the um, scenario workshops, especially when we work with uh, different types of stakeholder groups. So we always started with a briefing session, mainly with the objective to harmonize knowledge levels of participants, followed by group discussions about assumptions, drivers, key uncertainties, and the storylines, and so forth. And then um, adapting or developing the scenarios together with the stakeholders. It turned out that even when we 
produced um, a large number of products for stakeholders, but also relevant for scientists at the lower part, it turned out that not only the products were relevant, but our surveys clearly revealed that the scenario process as such was as much appreciated as the products that we delivered from this process. And that was about it. Many thanks for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Jörg, uh, for this very interesting presentation. I think uh, we have Lauren who will come in with the housekeeping information before we start the Q&A. Yes, hi, thank you. This is Lauren Hertel again, Communications Manager for the Global Land Program. I just wanted to remind everyone that your microphones are muted. We have had about 30 people join since the beginning of the webinar. And I wanted to let you know that all mics are muted uh, on everyone. <clears throat> Altogether, we have almost 100 attendees on the call today. Um, but we are taking your questions via the questions panel uh, on your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, you are welcome to ask questions during the presentations or during the question and answer period and we will be uh, handling those. In fact, for our very next section, um, some of the questions that have been posed will be, will be um, provided to Jörg for his answers. Um, also, if you have any kind of technical troubles during the webinar at all, you can use the chat window uh, webinar panel to reach out to organizers only. There's a drop down where you can reach out to organizers only and I can help you in the background if you're having any issues. A few questions did come in regarding getting slides, uh, copies of the presentations. Just wanted to let everyone know that um, within 24 hours of the webinar ending, I will be sending all registrants and attendees an email that will include a link to uh, each presentation today as well as a link to the full webinar recording. So you are welcome to use those, um, download them, forward them to colleagues, uh, anything that you would like. So thanks again for your attendance. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, because we are a little bit behind time, I will take just one question. There are two or three that came in. Um, somebody is asking, how, Jörg, how would you differentiate between um, and investigate preferable versus probable scenarios? Well, that's a, a debate we had many times. Um, that we cannot assess the probability of occurrence of any scenario. So in the end, all scenarios would have the same probability of occurrence, which is unknown. Uh, that's one reason um, why we use scenarios in such complex and uncertain situations, because we cannot predict system behavior. If we would be able to do that, we would have probability of occurrence of certain situations. But in the case of scenario, I would argue that's not possible there is no probability to associate it to no scenario. Thank you very much. Uh, the questions are slowly uh, trickling in, but I think I will try to put some order in them and keep them for, for the question and answer uh, session that we have after the three presentations so that we can move on to the next topic. And I would like to ask uh, Enrico Celio to get ready with his presentation. Enrico, Enrico, just a reminder, you are muted. Did you mute maybe at your headset? Is it better now? Yes, now we can hear you. Ah, very, very good. Everything fine? Yep, looks great. Good, thank you. So my name is Enrico. I'm, I'm a senior scientist at Planning of Landscape and Urban Systems Plus at ETH Zurich and currently visiting fellow 
at the Agriculture Partners in Washington, DC. I'm a geographer and spatial planner. I will focus here in this presentation on the actual setup process and uh, give examples how we worked in the field. I will mainly talk about land use and land use decision making. So in Eric Rabe and in Sieve and Jatitsohaina have strongly uh, supported that presentation with their work. I want to start with Urs. This is Urs on the picture and this picture captures my motivation but also um, kind of a success story for me. The picture shows Urs in a validation workshop and the sentence usually I need hours to think about that question and here we see the answer within a second was stated in that workshop. Hence with the help of this stakeholder group we could set up a model Urs could manipulate himself the digital version and stated that this tool could help him. Our goal in the end is to use that participatory modeling approach and the outputs such as maps, combine it perhaps with visualizations and to facilitate uh, planning processes, for example, to, to help decision making. But how to effectively input such a participatory modeling into planning processes is still a, a very tough question. I want to say a few words about our concepts and here perhaps um, Albrecht will be disappointed again because I, I, Bayesian networks for me are a means to the end and then I won't focus on any, any technical aspects of Bayesian networks. You see here um, our, what we call a participatory Bayesian network based land use modeling approach. Um, it's characterized by using a Bayesian network, of course, and combining it with, with spatial data and using it in a dynamic way. In the middle you see of this slide, you see a simplified Bayesian network where you have, for example, where you capture drivers here of a social network, of the economy or identity and, and biophysical data. And some aspects form an intention and then uh, a land use action or behavior um, we input, for example, a land use data of a current state in land use T0. We get out of, of our model compilation a land use probability of occurrence per cell and per land use category. This structure of the Bayesian network resembles a lot uh, Isaac Eisen's theory of plant behavior, where, where he also has this, this two state, um, two levels where he has intention and then the behavior and he, he talks about social norms, attitudes and perceived behavioral control which we translated here uh, to identity, policy and biophysical constraints. This is a Bayesian network how it could look like when you are using it and you see the nodes and the arrows. Arrows are reflecting causal relationships and each node has a certain number of states. You see here in this example, discrete uh, discrete nodes, but nodes could also be continuous. Every state has a probability, which is defined in a so-called conditional probability table, which is behind every, every node. And you may think of this table as, as, as kind of the configuration on how parent nodes have effect on, on, uh, on a child node. And in this exa example, I show you on the bottom right of the slide, there is a, a parent called distance to farm, a parent called slope, and another one agricultural to market, and they have effect on a node with two states, yes or no. And the numbers in there, these are the conditional probabilities. All is based on based on base rule of conditional probability, but in, in this whole network structure, we are using a, a network that um, calculates for us and compiles uh, these interdependencies of the of the causal relationships. When when you are talking about our setup process, etc., this is all based on existing guidelines, and and it's also very similar to the companion modeling approach that was also mentioned in the last webinar. I I, I put here some first authors and the year, so you might find. Uh, the, the references. Again, how do we do that now? And it's not something strict, blue map. We refer to that kind of label when we think of combining geodata with Bayesian networks, and usually it's in a in a participatory way. 
that we work with, with stakeholders. For this presentation, I revisited um, three case studies, two in Switzerland, one in Madagascar, two are currently ongoing and one in the past. And by revisiting, I, I could define kind of eight steps that we went through in each of these case study. We started with an exploration phase and then uh, a definition phase where we uh, were defining drivers, so the nodes and the states and the causal relations. We went on to uh, defining or estimating the conditional probabilities. And then we, we brought in the geodata. And then we went on to a validation and recalibration phase, the analysis of the outputs and the reporting, and in the best case, also an application uh, in the field. I focus here on two parts. And I'm starting with the driver states, the causal relations, with the, the case study in Entlebuch. The case study in Entlebuch is a typical pre-alpine landscape um, for Switzerland. You have small scale uh, sm small scale agriculture. You have an interaction of forest agriculture, and it's overlaid with with protected areas and tourism. For setting up uh, this network structure, the basin network, we went through a, a Delphi-like process where we had a, a group, uh, first a person-to-person -person interaction, and then a group interaction. We weighted uh, with a certain um, method the, the drivers we collected first and, and defined a final set of nodes. Then we went on to the node definition and we used an impact matrix to to have a starting point for the causal relations of the nodes uh, and hence the drivers of to each other. Um, and then the last part, which is usually the hardest part, is the, the estimate of the conditional probabilities. In this case, we we formed, uh, we designed simplified tables of conditional probabilities and you see now the colors. Uh, each one is a parent state and they have different states. Um, diff no, the different nodes and you yeah, have different states and expert had to estimate the, the conditional probabilities. The pictures on the right hand side show one of these group interactions where we were discussing uh, these estimates for conditional probabilities. Um, by having this first, this person, personal view of each expert, we, we also could get a um, an impression of the uncertainty of uh, that experts had estimating these different probabilities. Here we worked with six locally based um, experts. On the Swiss wide uh, land use change study, we, our, we worked with 24 experts helping us setting up the, the Bayesian network. And because they were not located and at the same place, we, we used a web-based approach, but, but went through a sim very similar uh, process, also with weighting and an imp impact matrix, and only to define the final structure of, of our Bayesian network, we gathered uh, the experts and we could discuss with them face-to-face -face the, the, the structure of the Bayesian network. This work, the, the web-based approach worked very well, but I think the, the extent on, on how participants could connect and also learn from each other was much smaller than in, in the in the Entlebuch case. So I go on to the to the sixth step and, and use here the, the example of northeastern Madagascar, which is a completely different context and, and, need, and we needed also different methods to work uh, on the ground. When we, we, we produced the first Bayesian network and we produced also first outputs of our, our land use change pathways into the future. So we had maps for future states of land use when we, when we went back to our case study areas. First, we, we explained the, the land use change scenarios and we had to discuss also questions such as, uh, do we need, or this was posed as questions to, towards us, uh, do we need to do now what, what is on this map? Is, are we, is this an obligation to, to act accordingly and to, to develop the land in this way? This was a very important discussion for us because uh, in this area where 
protected area are restricting uh, the options of farmers, this is a very valid question. We then proceeded with three type of exercises, which is uh, based a little bit on the thinking of, of Pontius and, and his validation methodology. We started with a dynamic exercise where we were focusing timing, so the timing of change. Then we uh, had a quantity exercise where we focused the amount and discussed the minimum occurrence of, of certain land use categories. And the allocation exercise um, was about the place or the location of the change and we went outside and uh, looked at specific parcels and discussed the change. Um, having these different uh, exercises gave us also the opportunity to ask to, have, to come up with an estimate at what level of, abs of abstraction our model would work well. Because in certain exercises, like the dynamic exercise, we had a generic situation and we were discussing in a group inside. Uh, all participants had to agree whether our proposed um, suggestion of land use change would be correct or not. In the quantity exercise, it was more specific because we were looking at the map. And in the allocation exercise, uh, we were outside and looked at a very specific plot and we, the group, the groups we reduced to, to about two to, th two to three persons. So we had many more judgments about uh, whether our suggestions would be correct. Th given this level of abstraction, we, we can now see, well, if we have these small groups in a very specific situation, this is the top left diagram where you see much more red than green. Red means our suggestion was rejected and the green was our suggestion for a future development of a, of a plot was agreed. So if you are outside with these small groups, the specific situation, we, we, were, we were predicting very poorly. Given that we only take the majority of these different groups, um, it, was, it was a little bit better. And then going to the second uh, line and to the left, if you are inside and describe a certain plot and, and reflect with participants how this plot should develop or would develop, we are better. And the last diagram on the bottom right, uh, we had also a regional expert group accompanying us and, and uh, the regional expert view and the generic situation was then quite okay. So I conclude here, we cannot uh, provide information for single plots, but perhaps at the strategic level for the whole village, our model can be uh, a help for, for decision making. To conclude here, um, there's lessons learned from, from these case studies. The person to person and group interaction, I think, was very valuable uh, for the setup process. At the same time, it's very, it's, it's time consuming. The estimation of the conditional probability is the hardest task and also um, the hardest, also the most um, discussed part because the ability of for human beings to estimate conditional probabilities is, is very limited. Then the setup group and the user group should be the same to, to really input our, our efforts in participatory modeling into a planning process. However, this setup group and the user groups are, they have different availabilities to work with us. So this is a challenge. And in the bottom, I think this could be a potential having our land use maps visualized um, to show people that are not familiar with maps what, what a certain land use change could mean for their landscape. Uh, this could be a way forward. And with this, I uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Enrico, for your presentation. Very interesting. And uh, we can take one or two questions, maybe. Somebody is asking you, how do you represent intentions in the model? And how do you translate that into probability sets? Yeah, right. thank you for that. The, the, our, from our kind of theoretical background using Isaac Eisen's theory of plant behavior, um, we, we lean on, on, on that theory and say, well, uh, he, he was thinking that this 
intentions are formed by beliefs and we translate these beliefs and into drivers and, and nodes of our um, of our base and network. These drivers are then forming an intention. But this 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 is a node in the end in our base and network, and this is a huge challenge always to to capture this intention because uh, asking a participant in a process about intention is is very very difficult. Mm -hmm. And the, the, in general, the, the even for example, if you are if you're not able to work with these estimates and tables that I showed you with the case study in Entlebuch, but we are working in in, in workshop settings that are less formalized in in the way we we put numbers. Uh, it's a huge challenge to turn that knowledge we gather in workshops in a very qualitative manner into numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jörg mentioned in his presentation that uh, the process was valued at least as much as the outputs and uh, one of the attendees would like to know if that is also the case uh, in your project. Yeah, uh, for sure. The, 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 this, this learning process we went through um, is, uh, is very important for the, for, for, also for the added value for the participants, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are a couple of other questions, but I think they, they are not specific to you, so we can keep them for after the third presentation. And uh, then I would like to ask Jürgen to get ready and to introduce briefly his own person, his work, and then to make his presentation. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction, Albi, um, as mentioned. My name is Jürgen and I work uh, for Quantis International, a uh, company uh, consultancy in the domain of sustainability, in the sustainability space. Um, my background is in information systems, but I always worked in life cycle assessment, which is uh, probably the most prominent method for to quantify environmental impacts of products and services, to compare biofuels with fossil mobility, uh, to compare electric mobility uh, with biofuels and so forth. Uh, and um, it was in this context in, in 2010 that we, did, that we did for the Swiss Technology Assessment Group uh, um, a scenario analysis for uh, the second generation biofuels and we applied the, the formative scenario analysis method and that was also kind of the foundation to apply it again in the, con in the context of uh, uh, research for development project I'm going to talk about now. But maybe also um, uh, some more words to Quantis uh, to give you a little bit of context. Uh, we are a global team of uh, meanwhile 80 people uh, distributed over uh, the globe. So we have offices in uh, Lausanne, in Zurich, in Berlin, in Milano, in Paris, in Boston and in Bogota. And we uh, recently celebrated our 10 years anniversary. Um, and our, the core of our work is really to bridge uh, the gap between science, the science of sustainability and also its application in business practices. And we have a, a, a range of metrics, tools and strategies we apply. And in the context of the uh, ProBiomass project I'm going to talk about, uh, the focus, for example, we applied the, the life cycle perception, perception game uh, to uh, um, generate awareness and engage participants uh, about environmental impacts of, uh, for example, charcoal production. So now to the topic. It's about prospects of uh, biomass energy in East Africa, and I will. It's uh, I can just I could just talk ten minutes about uh, all of the, uh, the the overall framework of the project. It was a three years project. Today the topic is uh, the formative uh, scenario analysis method and uh, uh, the insights gained by it. Um, so um, why uh, the focus of uh, um, biomass? Um, if we look into uh, recent statistics, we see that more that, than 80% of the cooking in uh, Kenya, but also in Tanzania, is done on the basis of uh, charcoal or wood. So these energy carriers are very important in a local context. And so the overall goal of the project was to assess the prospect of sustainable biomass energy value chains used for cooking 
uh, with the idea to contribute knowledge-based energy policies that uh, improve the urban population access to energy. Our case study sites were in Kenya and in Tanzania. So we were in a uh, Kutui country, which uh, has something like one million inhabitants. And uh, the other case, type, uh, case study site was in Moshi, which uh, Moshi is uh, the, the, uh, a town in the Kilimanjaro region and um, roughly 75 kilometers uh, from Arusha. And um, so we always had workshops in, in, in these two case study sites. And as mentioned, our focus was uh, on different energy carriers and their use for cooking. So we focused on wood, we focused on charcoal, uh, we focused on briquettes, we focused on biomass, and we focused on uh, chadrofa, uh, but not uh, cultivated as monocultures, but as hedges. And, he'll, and indeed, the, the kind of end or final use was uh, using these energy carriers for cooking. And um, if we look, um, we uh, indeed it was the focus was not on a particular energy energy carrier or a particular fuel, but also kind of the entire value chain, meaning from the biomass availability to the production technology, uh, transport, and then also the use. So all of uh, the, the technologies used along this uh, value chain were subject of analysis. Um, and our, um, we assess these biomass value chains not only for today, uh, but uh, also for the future of uh, for the year 2030 to be precise. And we use the scenarios for this assessment precisely because of the reasons Jörg has already highlighted in his presentations. Uh, a scenario is a plausible description of how the system under study may develop in the future. Uh, there are various kinds of scenarios and we use explorative scenarios to do uh, this assessment. And uh, in our context, for example, we uh, looked at uh, a pro-biomass energy scenario and how this uh, um, particular future state would affect the uh, value, biomass energy values chains under study. And we did the same also for kind of an anti-biomass energy scenario. So how did we come up with these scenarios? How did we develop them? We used the, the formative scenario methods, um, me uh, analysis method, which offers a general and approved framework for the systematic generation of consistent scenarios. So the unit of analysis are trends which shape the future, and it's not kind of a discussion of an abstract future. So we are really talking about the impact factors, the trends. And so a, a scenario or a particular future state is defined by a set of impact factors and their corresponding development trends. So an impact factor could be, for example, the price of uh, fossil fuels or intensification of agriculture. And the corresponding trend for fossil fuels could be that it decreases or that it uh, increases, to express it in a uh, rather simplistic fashion. And we could define similar trends also for the intensification of agriculture. And if you do this for eight or so uh, impact factors, um, you have a very good foundation to do a comprehensive analysis of the relationships among all these development trends. And this facilitates a selection of a co coherent and internally consistent set of scenarios. So this is kind of the procedure we applied. Um, um, it's uh, already an kind of an adapted version of the formative scenario method, which was applied in the uh, TIA Swiss study I mentioned from 2010. And in this study, we had a very high degree of stakeholder involvement. So throughout all of the steps, uh, there was a, a workshop with stakeholders. Uh, while in this uh, development setting, we uh, were only able to involve stakeholders at the definition of impact factors and their corresponding development trends. And I will also highlight later why where we, we had this limitation. Um, so um, there, um, the, the, the goal of the first step is to consider the influence factors that potentially affect uh, the, the system under study. Uh, and basically, we have three steps. So we have the elucidation and selection of impact factors. We have the elucidation and selection of related development trends. And we have uh, then the consolidation of impact factors and development trends. And we had one day workshops for each case study site with roughly 20 participants. 
um, from covering uh, local and regional government, uh, rural and urban biomass industry, and uh, rural and urban population. So it was a quite a diverse stakeholder group we uh, were working with. And we used uh, group work, plenary discussions, and voting for the elucidation of impact factors. Now, that was kind of the result produced by that. Uh, so we have, we see the factors, we see the trends, and we also uh, uh, discussed uh, associated consequences. And so we identified 12 impact factors and 25 corresponding trends overall. For Kitui and for Moshi, uh, 12 factors and 28 trends. So an impact factor can have more than two trends. That's the reason why these numbers differ. Uh, and then um, we were, uh, the, the, the project team uh, refined and reduced the factors. So there was some overlap, at least in part, between the, the, the impact factors. They were named differently, but they meant the same thing. And with the support also of a local expert team, um, indeed, this project was done with an international uh, team. Um, we were able to reduce these impact factors. And this was an important step because you have for each and every combination of uh, uh, impact factor trends, you have to define uh, uh, the relationship between them, which uh, in, in this case generated a uh, consistency matrix of uh, 768 relationships uh, for Kitui and 256 for Moshi. And uh, in terms of relationships, uh, we filled these consistency matrices with these impact factors. Uh, this was cross-checked and supported in several iterations with local experts. So for example, when I say we assess the relationships between impact factors, it means that uh, for the example of uh, price of liquefied petroleum gas decreases, um, does this or in what uh, regard does this affect eating habits, uh, namely the uh, decreasing uh, in meat consumption? If it, uh, is it inconsistent, meaning that both of these trends cannot happen at the same time? Is it coexistent, meaning that both trends are independent of each other? Are they reinforcing or are they even conditional, uh, conditional meaning that they, uh, one conditions uh, the others? And once uh, we had filled these uh, metrics, um, we uh, fed them into a matrix analysis software. Um, which uh, there are specific softwares around to do this, but uh, it, such analysis can also be done in, in, uh, in MATLAB, for example. And uh, the software provides then support to make an informed selection on the potentially available uh, boundary scenarios. So we, we, we have hundreds of scenarios, which are uh, at least in theory possible. And then by uh, using um, the uh, additive consistency uh, and inconsistency values, we are able to reduce them and to make informed selection according to the consistency criterion. How consistent is this scenario? Uh, is it inconsistent? Um, uh, what uh, kind of uh, diversity do uh, the selected scenarios have? And there is also kind of a subjective probability criterion, uh, meaning that the prob probability of your occurrence uh, is also should also be considered as the last criterion. So with this kind of uh, mathematical assessment, we can make informed choices. And uh, for the case of Kitui, for example, we see our uh, influence factors such as urbanization, context-specific education and awareness, decentralization of governments. And we see um, the set of uh, corresponding trends which define the boundary scenario. So urbanization in the pro-biomass scenario, urbanization remains constant context-specific education and awareness increases, uh, accessibility of improved biomass technology is high, and so forth. And um, so we, we selected these kind of boundary scenarios and were then able to use this information, also using spatial analysis and GIS systems to translate each boundary scenario into a so-called system scenario, which models basically the effects of a particular boundary scenarios on bio, um, biomass availability and the efficiency of its utilization. And one result we could generate with this is, uh, for example, answering the question, how many meals can be cooked with the available biomass potential? 
and uh, yeah, depending which kind of feedstocks and the transform transformation technologies are used, there's there uh, is a huge variability in kind of the, uh, the the potential meals which can be cooked. So that's one of the uh, insights we could generate with these uh, scenarios, and also uh, we could also translate this into the realm of environmental impacts. So what is the corresponding carbon impact, or what are associated costs? That was kind of one of the key outcomes of the project. But uh, yeah, what can we conclude about the application of the formative scenario analysis method? Uh, it was even though we kind of uh, simplified the process, it was quite time intensive um, uh, because many of the tasks which are typically done in stakeholder groups due to the uh, uh, spatial uh, difference, uh, we, we mostly had, uh, yeah, we still had to invest the time, but without stakeholders. So it's a very time intensive process, like filling out the consistency metrics, uh, elucidation, all of the impact factors. It's also complex to apply in a development setting, and uh, particularly across a quite diverse stakeholder group. So um, you have to simplify, it requires simplification. Um, and uh, yeah, one key simplification for us was to limit the involvement of stakeholders um, to just this step. And then once you have your boundary scenario, um, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, quite challenging also to translate this into uh, the actual impact on biomass value chains. So that's not straightforward and uh, the use of uh, spatial analysis tools and GIS helps a lot uh, also to, to do this task, this quantification. Uh, the benefits associated with the um, application are that uh, we have uh, an improved stakeholder engagement from the beginning stakeholders were very uh, engaged um, uh, systematic it's a systematic and approved procedure which was already applied several times um, it supports knowledge co-creation um, and it uh, really was a great way um, to kind of uh, come in contact with uh, the stakeholder group and to discuss uh, uh, to, yeah, to, uh, to immerse into the relevant context and it uh, allows with its approach to improve consistency, plausibility and relevance. Um, and uh, in our case, we used it to explore biophysical implications, um, not only in regard to resource utilization, but also in regard to environmental performance. And in this regard, it also uh, assisted in uh, us in informed, uh, providing knowledge-based uh, transformations. Um, yes. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, maybe just before I end uh, to highlight the formative scenario method, one uh, relevant publication uh, from Scholz and Titier from 2002. Uh, if you are interested in the application of the method uh, in the uh, technology assessment I mentioned at the beginning, future perspective of second generation biofuels, that's uh, where you should look at. And if you are interested in uh, what we did on the biophysical level and environmental impact level, you could also look into the policy brief, which is related with uh, the prospect biomass project. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Jürgen, for this very nice presentation and very clear presentation. I think uh, the way you have put it in a systematic way has enabled us to understand how the how this approach is working um, the first challenge that you mentioned had to do with time time constraints or, or the, the need for a lot of time and in an earlier slide uh, you mentioned that the workshops took one day that doesn't seem like a lot of time and uh, I link this to an earlier question which was raised to an earlier speaker what is the time for scenario workshops Yes, how I mean, much, how, sorry, how much time do stakeholders need? I mean, that's that was an addition to the question. How much time do stakeholders need to invest in, into such a process? Uh, yeah, I think it depends in how much you stick to the standard <laughs> method, to the standard receipt, or how much you are willing to uh, to adapt. Um, in, in our case, I think it, as mentioned, it was one day of uh, per, per, per case study site to uh, get the stakeholders engaged, but it required a lot of preparation, particularly like preparing examples for uh, impact factors, for associated development trends, and uh, communicating them in an, uh, a very easy and hands-on way. 
So there was a lot of uh, preparation in advance. And then it's kind of uh, one day to get everyone engaged, but then it requires a lot of pre-processing. And this, so kind of the research team was kind of in East Africa for two weeks on this kind of workshop tour. There were also many other topics. Uh, and, and after this step, we went uh, back and there was an exchange between local experts and the team in Switzerland uh, to kind of do the, the, the uh, Pre uh, the, the, yeah, the subsequent processing, and that was indeed very time consuming and required several iterations to be to ensure that we are still grounded in uh, the local context and do not uh, lose it. So, there were many iterations necessary for that. Um, yes, but I think in the end, with this, you are, yeah, there is some flexibility in, in adapting the method to the actual needs. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to ask the two other speakers to turn on their mic and uh, and their camera because I think we can open up and 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 direct some questions to them as well. Uh, there are a couple of questions that have to do with how to manage the such a process. I mean, somebody was asking how how do you ensure or how do you deal with uh, power imbalances in in such a stakeholder group if somebody is is taking too much space and and sidelining other stakeholders somebody else was asking um uh how how do you how do you kind of reconcile conflicting responses from different groups uh, um in, in, into your into your scenarios and and you know what what do you need to be careful about this kind of things so, I think any one of you who has an answer to that question could just take, uh, could, could just start. Yeah. Yes. The, I think the power and also the conflicting <coughs> interests, um, we try to caution a little bit by the by this person-to-person -person group it interaction I presented. But this was not possible, for example, in, in the Madagascar case study area. Um, we try that also to separate in groups and to have smaller opinions and then uh, facilitate an, a, a discussion where, where, where arguments would count and not, not the power of, of this or the status of, of the speaker. But uh, that's uh, sometimes a, a big problem, yeah? Or a challenge, let's say a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, we usually have the strategy that we try to avoid inviting people with direct hierarchical relationships um, that can help um, say buffer these um, strong personalities and strong opinions if there is no person present who is directly depending on the other person. Um, on the other hand, um, it very much always depends on the facilitator and on the quality of the moderation process. But um, this is not relevant in all the stakeholder um, workshops and processes I have been involved in, but uh, many times issues like that come up and you have to be pragmatic and find different solutions. Our strategy <laughs> also has been <clears throat> to use um, strongly diverging views and perceptions for defining very different um, pathways into the future. So both would persist and we would try to convince people that it makes sense um, to keep very different um, perceptions on how the future may unfold and not just a dominating one. So that mm -hmm. could also help um, to buffer uh, strong personalities and strong opinions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did any of you use uh, social media in this kind of processes or, or, or approaches? Because there's a question somebody is asking, what would be the potential of such tools, social media, and is there danger in using them for, for scenario making participatory processes? Well, actually, we, we used online and offline methods um, to limit the amount of time uh, people have to travel physically. For example, um, 
after such a stakeholder workshop, usually we try to have different iteration rounds to improve the discussion, the assumptions, the sets of drivers or the narratives that we have started in this process. And we do this, for example, in the fashion that we ask certain stakeholders whether they would be available after the workshop to revise products that have been generated and further elaborated scenario team. So we try to combine online and offline methods um, to advance the process and limit um, the effort of, of physical um, movements of mm -hmm. dozens of people. Mm -hmm. Potentially to define which which is the the place where really then the decision is made, which I don't know which scenario is looked at or where that that this cannot be done perhaps via social media or it needs to be defined at the beginning that this is a kind of the place where decisions also are are made. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Another question that probably concerns you all is uh, how how do you um how do you translate or break down larger concepts into something that is manageable and understandable? Or how do you translate global trends, for, for example, trends that happen at the, at the continental level or the global level, into regional and local effects when you, when you deal with scenarios and, and with stakeholders? Well, in our last uh, European scale project where we developed scenarios at the European level, <clears throat> there were like a dozen case study groups who intended to use the European scale scenarios and downscale or adapt them for their local level. And they used quite different strategies. Um, in this case, we had the advantage that we had quantified um, scenario assumptions of how um, drivers of change would evolve over time. So they could take C these <clears throat> and compare them to um, knowledge they generated in their regions and see whether that would uh, fit or not fit to uh, levels of change they have been identifying there. Also with respect to the um, thematic um, issues, because we all know that large scale drivers may or may not be um, relevant at the same level in a certain region or vice versa. Regional drivers may not show up in global or European scale scenarios. Another issue that helped them adapt the scenarios was that we developed structured um, storylines, that is the narratives that we generated with the stakeholders were all of the same structure, which made it easier for them <clears throat> to use this structure and compare it to issues they had back home in their region um, and adapt uh, the European scale scenarios um, to the problems or land use questions that were more urgent in their home region. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll one last question to, to Jürgen. Uh, somebody is asking how do you balance qualitative and quantitative data when you are uh, co-designing scenarios? Um, yes, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a smooth transition, uh, I would say, and it requires, uh, in our case, it required a, a lot of uh, back and forth between uh, the local experts and uh, our team here um, to ensure that what kind of uh, moving from the definition of impact factors and then how they relate to each other. That's really one of the key steps in the formative scenario uh, analysis method. And here it's also, I think, uh, diversity and um, arguing, oh, it's kind of also at, uh, having a certain culture to discuss certain relations, which is not, if you are in a, in a, in a, in a smaller group, it's much easier to have this discussion. 
than in a in a more broad uh, stakeholder group. So uh, here, um, for us, we uh, I think in, in our small group that uh, worked sometimes at least quite well. And uh, with uh, the feedback loop of local stakeholders, we were also able to develop a line on the same narrative. Thank you very much. I think we have to stop the, the Q&A now. And uh, we have asked all three of you to make a final take home uh, statement or message. And I would propose that we start with Jürg and then we go in the same order as the presentations were given. And just when one is finished, the next one can take over without me intervening. OK. Some of the take-home messages we have identified from various participatory scenario developments are that stakeholders mostly value the scenario process and within this process, especially um, learning and communication just as much as the products. So the scenario information that we generate, data, leaflets, presentations, policy briefs, and so forth. So the process is just as important as the products. <clears throat> In our surveys, it turned out that uh, stakeholders agree that the scenarios are an appropriate tool or method to assess uh, potential land-related changes and many of their impacts. But they also sometimes complain about the complexity of the approach. We said that land systems are complex social environmental systems. That is what uh, the stakeholders were um, complaining about. Um, and we had more complaints when modeling was involved because that adds another level of complexity. Stakeholders also argued that um, in the region where they stay, they would partly lack the data, for example, to initiate such a regional scenario process. And furthermore, they also sometimes complain that they have see a limited possibility to apply what they learned, for example, to initiate the desired pathways of change, to put them into practice. So that was related um, not having the capacity or not being in the position to do the, to do so. <clears throat> in participatory um, scenario processes, we also have seen uh, some limitations. Um, we've seen that it's sometimes difficult to handle these strong or dominant personalities and opinions. We discussed that uh, already or to integrate conflicting um, perspectives and objectives. Um, we also found that in these processes, there is a limited possibility to address illegal activities. Um, I mention that because uh, we came across this problem several times, not only in the ones I highlighted as examples, agricultural expansion in areas that are protected, illegal water extraction in agriculture, in herding, or acti illegal activities in mining, um, using a huge amount of land and um, even more water that's related to gold extraction, for example. So those issues are really difficult to address in scenarios because we had the experience that partners with whom you collaborate would not like to see these illegal aspects being uh, pointed out in scenario approaches. So with that, I would like to end and pass the word to the next speaker. It's Enrico's turn now. Yeah, I, I've i tried to focus on one message and uh, it was anticipated already twice by by a question and, it, and now also by Jörg. Uh, creating a learning experience for participants and modelers is a very good starting point. Um, the learning is very important to to create this, this learning in, in that process. And then 
I think participants and modelers are on both sides. There is a learning press, uh, process going on. And the starting point, because I, as a spatial planner, I would, I would, st I still strive to bring that then to decision making and to, to the process, uh, to the planning process. Yes. And I can hand over to the, to Jürgen. Yes, uh, I will not share my screen. I will, uh, but uh, simply discuss kind of the four core ingredients uh, for take-home messages. First, when we were at the beginning of the process not very uh, sure about whether uh, the formative scenario method is uh, appropriate, uh, how, how we should deal with it, and uh, particularly because of the large time effort. Um, and it was a decision under, under uncertainty as often to basically adapt this method and work with it. And I think I, uh, one key insight from my side is that it's uh, yeah, it's, it's not just a focus on a default application of a method, but also um, think outside the box of how you can uh, adapt it to your particular needs. And then I think also, as already mentioned by Jörg, the uh, organization is really key. Um, also breaking down complex topics into hands-on experience. Um, we were also very lucky to have uh, an amazing facilitator which uh, was able to balance um, the different uh, powers and uh, the different engagement level of the participant. And I think that's really a very important uh, factor for the success of such an endeavor. Um, and yeah, last but not least, uh, I think it's good to be aware that uh, a particular scenario method is not only a means to achieve a particular end, but it's an end in itself, as already highlighted by your friend. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your attention. Okay, I'm taking the screen if Lauren can give it to me. And I would like to thank all three speakers very much for their excellent presentations. Um, I would like just to conclude uh, with this graph that you might have seen. It's uh, adapted from Gill's 2002. And it shows uh, why innovative transformative uh, initiatives have a hard time to escape their niches and to achieve shifts in the prevailing regime. The regime itself is dominated by what, what the author calls uh, uh, the landscape developments. Uh, however, the, however, this landscape level has a very strong inertia. Think, for example, of the fossil fuel economy as the, a landscape level element. It is conditioning so many things at the regime level, such as professional and, and recreative mobility, for example, or, or even land use planning, that finding an alternative to it is very difficult. And finding this alternative would be envisioning a, a different uh, future. And this is again where scenarios can help us breaking out from such mainstream structures and imagining different development pathways. And I would like to end on that quote from uh, Yuval Harari on uh, the way to imagine alternative destinies for ourselves and our planet. Thank you very much. And I'm giving back the microphone to uh, Isabel who will uh, wrap up and tell us how it goes on from here. Yeah, thank you, Albi. So we are coming to an end of this third webinar. And I would also like to thank from my side to the three speakers who share the very interesting work and experiences. And I would also like to thank the audience um, who was actively asking questions. So we would like to invite uh, all of you to participate in a short survey about the webinar. Uh, we will share the link for this survey later. Um, but there we would like to hear your feedback, uh, maybe suggestions for improvements and so on. And the presentation and recording of the webinar uh, will be shared with all of you also through mails. And we will try to answer the questions which we couldn't answer now in this webinar. And those of you who are not yet a member of GLP, 
I would like to invite you to become a member and if you're interested also to join the working group on co-production. And then I would like to again remind you how our webinar series is continuing. So we will have a webinar about the third practical example on the 4th of December and the topic will be the use of spatial tools, remote sensing and GIS. So we would warmly like to invite you to be part of that webinar um, as well and to join us. And more information about that webinar will be shared uh, shortly with all of you. So then I would like to thank everybody and uh, say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.